Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Going to do our best for the next 30 minutes to both entertain, inspire, and enlighten. On tap today, much has been said about the positive effects of a plant-based diet in terms of type 2 diabetes, but what about type 1 diabetes? We were going uh, we are going to explore how much a change in diet can impact your health if you have type 1 diabetes when we're joined by Dr. Hanna Kaliova coming up. New case studies are out on this and Dr. Kaliova they look very promising so I'm very much looking forward to speaking with you. Me too. Thanks for having me, Chuck. And then also on the show today at long last, Dr. Jazz. Dr. Jasmine Zardana makes her return to the exam room and we will be opening up the doctor's mailbag, which means that this is your opportunity to ask all things, questions related to diet, nutrition, and health. Dr. Jazz, looking forward to opening up the mailbag with you. Thanks, Chuck, me too. And so that means you right now can go ahead and submit your questions in the comments section. We'll be opening that up in just a little bit. But first, let's start with the check on what is happening in the world. Here are your health headlines for Thursday, July 23rd, 2020. The number of coronavirus-related deaths continues to climb. More than 1,100 lives lost Wednesday, the most since May. And nearly 70,000 new infections have also been reported within the last 24 hours, bringing the total caseload to nearly 4 million a milestone that should be met within a matter of hours. Meanwhile, records show California has overtaken New York to become the state with the most confirmed cases since the beginning of the pandemic. A new study finds diets rich in protein can lower the risk of death and diets specifically rich in plant protein are particularly beneficial. The research published in the British Medical Journal finds plant protein consumption is linked to an 8% lower risk of all-cause mortality and 12% lower risk for cardiovascular disease. Researchers believe the findings can be attributed to a plant-based diet's beneficial effects on chronic illnesses such as heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. The study's authors conclude, quote, plant protein can be increased relatively easily by replacing animal protein and could have a large effect on longevity. Data for more than 700,000 participants was reviewed. Don't be shy about sprinkling that cinnamon on top of your oatmeal tomorrow. There is new evidence today that it can help prevent type 2 diabetes. In a study published in the Journal of the Endocrine Society, researchers found more stable blood sugar levels in participants who had cinnamon compared to those who were giving a placebo. Improved glucose tolerance was also noted, and more promising yet, the benefits seem to be long-lasting, with A1C levels also improving. And finally, today, it is opening day for Major League Baseball. And if you're a free agent fan with no team in particular to follow, why not put your support behind plant-powered sluggers like Matt Kemp of the L.A. Dodgers and Oakland A's pitcher Mike Fiers? There's also Josh Bell of the Pittsburgh Pirates, J.D. Martinez of the Boston Red Sox, and Josh Donaldson of the Minnesota Twins, all of whom fall into the mostly vegan category. Thanks to our resident baseball expert, Noah Kaufman, for putting that list together. Uh, also, a tip of the hat to Chase Utley, recently retired, but now doing tremendous work with Dotsie Bausch's Switch for Good campaign, all about eliminating dairy consumption. And uh, by the way, tonight, first game of the season, Washington Nationals versus New York Yankees, Dr. Anthony Fauci will be throwing out the first pitch. Go Mets. Moving on. When you think about diabetes, there's a good chance you're thinking about type 2 diabetes. I mean, think about it, right? We just talked about that with the cinnamon study. But what about type 1 diabetes? What can a plant-based diet do for that? There are 1.6 million Americans currently living with type 1 diabetes. And that is what we want to talk about here on the show today as we welcome Dr. Hanna Kaliova to the exam room live. Dr. Kaliova, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, you just published a new paper specifically looking at the effects of a plant-based diet with people living with type 1 diabetes, includes some really promising case studies. Uh, before we dive into that, can you just explain to us as a refresher what the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes is? Absolutely. Most cases of diabetes worldwide are type 2 diabetes which usually uh, takes several decades to develop. So mostly 
older people get type 2 diabetes. The average age for type 2 diagnosis is some, somewhere between 50 and 60 years of age. Uh, and usually um, people just gradually put on some weight, are gaining weight over decades, and uh, then eventually uh, the diagnosis is laboratory, you know, it's elevated blood sugar. Uh, so many people don't know about having prediabetes or, di or diabetes for several uh, years even. Uh, so it's important to have your blood sugar checked every uh, year or two. Uh, and uh, so type 2 diabetes uh, usually takes several decades to develop. Uh, but type 1 diabetes um, usually um, can occur in a, at a young age in children. And interestingly, um, the incidence of even type 1 diabetes goes up worldwide. Uh, it, it's, it's increasing by 3, three to 5% a year worldwide. And um, that led us to question the reasons for this. Is there anything we can do about our lifestyle that would influence the risk of type 1 diabetes? And, uh, uh, you know, interestingly, we know about the health benefits of a plant-based diet for type 2 diabetes for decades already. Um, we've done so many research studies on this, you know, where uh, many people with type 2 diabetes can, can completely reverse their diabetes uh, within several months and uh, sometimes they can be completely medication free. But what about type one? You know, a plant-based diet is so high in carbohydrates and that may prevent many healthcare professionals from prescribing it to people with type one diabetes. Uh, and yet it has been found that fiber rich foods such as whole grains and legumes and fruits and vegetables uh, have been associated with improved glycemic control, both in type 2 and in type 1 uh, diabetes patients. So uh, what we did in this paper, we found two people who, two people with type 1 diabetes who switched over to a plant-based diet, and we just recorded what happened. And I would like to share these two stories with you. Yeah, but by, by, by all means, please share. I love the way that you phrase that. We just recorded what happened. So, you know, matter of fact, yeah. so laissez-faire, as it were. But what happened was really some impressive results. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what it was that you guys noticed. Yeah. So uh, one story is from a 42-year-old male who was diagnosed with his type 1 diabetes many years ago. Uh, and all of a sudden, he heard about the success of, you know, treating type 2 diabetes with a plant-based diet. And he was just curious. He was like, what if I um, completely ditch all the dairy and all the, all the meat? What happens to me as a type 1 diabetic? And uh, originally, before he switched over to a plant-based diet, he was consuming, he was very much uh, concerned about his carbohydrate intake, as most diabetics are. So his carbohydrate intake was about 150 grams per day. And then he made a huge dietary shift. And all of a sudden, he was consuming uh, somewhere between 400 and 500 grams of carbohydrates per day. And in spite of all the huge increase in carbohydrate intake, his insulin requirements went down by 50%. That's wow. incredible. Uh, his total in insulin dose before he changed his diet was uh, 50 to 60 units per day. And then after he made the dietary change, uh, he only needed 26 units per day. So in spite of eating all that carbohydrate, uh, you know, his insulin sensitivity went up significantly. Uh, his carbohydrate to insulin ratio uh, went up five to six times. So in other words, one unit of insulin was able to cover uh, five to six times more grams of carbohydrate than before. And that's really good news for people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, you know, he, although he was not able to get off his insulin, 
you know, he's completely dependent on his insulin. Still, his uh, dose of insulin went down by 50%. Uh, think also about all the savings. Insulin, uh, you know, is not super cheap. So no think also about the savings. Uh, but mo most importantly, the benefits for your health. If you can only use 50% of the insulin that you have been using until now, um, that would be a huge improvement, right? Well, yeah, but and and here's what really kind of stands out to me in the paper that you you published, and we'll put a link to it uh, up in the the comment section here. Uh, the gentleman was initially diagnosed at 25 years old, did not make these changes until he was 42. So we're talking about a 17 year gap, and was still, despite all that time, able to see substantial improvements. That to me speaks volumes, and I think is very promising. Absolutely. It's never too late to make these changes. And the second case uh, that you looked at, this was actually a young woman initially, mm -hmm. still a teenager when she was diagnosed. Yeah, she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when she was 17 years old, so super young. And uh, initially, uh, she chose the opposite strategy uh, to a plant-based diet. She uh, you know, she has been recommended to go on a low carb diet. So she decided to drastically limit her carbohydrate intake to only 30 grams per day or even less. Mm. And she noticed that although her blood sugar levels were kind of steady, she noticed that she was needing more insulin to cover those grams of carbohydrate. So, um, you know, her insulin requirements went up per gram of carbohydrate. And that that really, you know, worried her. And also uh, her cholesterol went up. Uh, I'll find the numbers for you. The, her cholesterol went up from 175 to 221 milligrams per deciliter. And uh, we know that diabetics are at a much higher risk for cardiovascular disease. Uh, people with diabetes, women with diabetes, uh, their risk of cardiovascular disease is 11 times higher compared with non-diabetic population. Uh, for males, it's uh, about five to six times higher. Uh, so these are huge numbers and diabetics die uh, about a decade earlier for cardiovascular disease than non-diabetic population. Wow. So a rise in cholesterol in her case was really something concerning. And uh, that made her think, you know, is there any alternative? Can I, um, can I try something new? Can I try a diet that would not only keep my blood sugar stable, but it would also help me address the underlying causes and the cardiovascular disease risk? And that's when she switched over to a plant-based diet. She started eating uh, a diet that was high in fiber. She uh, left out all the dairy, all the eggs, and all the meat, and uh, focused on uh, a, whole, a whole foods plant-based diet, whole grains, legumes, uh, vegetables, and fruits. And uh, what followed was pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, she dropped a few pounds, which really helped her. Uh, because she felt kind of chubby in the beginning. So uh, this, that was like a welcomed effect of a plant-based diet. Uh, and also her insulin requirements went down by about 25%. Mm. Uh, her carbohydrate to insulin ratio uh, went up uh, by 50%. So she was more uh, sensitive to the insulin she was injecting in, in spite of the lower dose she was reacting more to it and she was able to cover more carbohydrate with the same dose of insulin. Uh, and uh, her, so, cholesterol, uh, her cholesterol completely normalized and went down from the original 221 at the end of the low carbohydrate diet down to 158 milligrams per deciliter. So completely normal. Uh, and that's one of the most important factors for, for her cardiovascular risk. Absolutely. And she's such a, a young girl. And you were just saying, you know, she was a little bit overweight. She had high cholesterol. Uh, 
technically at that age, you still have your whole life ahead of you, but exactly. obviously if she continues on this healthier path, how many years do you think she's adding to her life just by making these changes? It seems to me like she's put herself in place to, to really, you know, make sure that she's living as long and as healthfully as possible. Yeah, absolutely. This is a fascinating question. How much life can you add uh, if you are, uh, you know, completely normalizing your risk factors? Uh, so when she started um, the the low carbohydrate diet, her A1C, the marker of glycemic control, was 8.7. When she ended her vegan diet, or when she, you know, after a few months into her vegan diet her A1C was 5.4. So that's a huge difference. Each one point of A1C can contribute to a, about a 10% increase in cardiovascular risk over a decade. So, you know, uh, one small change may make a huge impact a decade later if you are consistent. And that's only A1C. Uh, so right. an, an A1C reduction um, could probably uh, decrease her cardiovascular risk by about uh, by about 10 years or 10 uh, percent. I mean, that's, and, that's fantastic. And, and I love the way that you put that is it's like the huge effect that one small change can have. Right. And I think that that's so important that people keep in mind for any change that they're trying to make to improve their health is that it may seem overwhelming at first. And because of that, you're like, why even bother? But then when you, the doctor who studies this for a living says, no, no, one small change can make all of this difference, all the difference in the world. Just look, that's a reason not to delay and just get going and, and, and things can happen. I want to ask you uh, real quick as we wrap this up. This paper, this research, these case studies, what do you think this effect could be on treatment in the long term? We're starting to see plant-based diets being prescribed more regularly for mm -hmm. people with type 2 diabetes. Do you see this perhaps in the near future, similar uh, treatments being prescribed for those with type 1 diabetes? That's a fantastic question, Chuck. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we're, we're seeing this shift, um, but we also need to say, uh, there's a need for a randomized clinical trial um, that would probably uh, map out the differences between people and what kind of uh, what kind of effect we could expect on average, uh, you know, when people switch over to a plant-based diet. But in the meantime, um, you know, we can definitely encourage our uh, young people or our patients with type one diabetes to give a plant-based diet a shot. Awesome. Dr. Hanna Kaliova, thank you so very much for your time. You, I love it so much when you come on the show because you really bring the science like no other. Like if, if you want to nerd out about nutrition and health, you are my go-to person. I love it so very much. So thanks so much for the time. This has really been promising and uh, I look forward to having you back on the show sometime soon. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Chuck. And by the way, you can indeed find a link to those studies uh, in the uh, comment box right now. Our producer, Laura Anderson, was kind enough to drop those in there for you. So if you want to give them a good once over, go ahead and click that link and we'll get you all schooled up. And speaking of getting schooled up, school is in session and our professor today is Dr. Jazz. Dr. Jazz Mulsardana here now to answer all things related to health and nutrition as we open up the doctor's mailbag to answer your questions. Dr. Jazz, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you so much for having me, Chuck. All right. Keep those questions coming in the comment section now. Everything is there. You can also tweet them to us using the hashtag exam room podcast. You ready to rock and roll? Let's go. All right. First question. Uh, vitamin D question. Vegan versus non-vegan sources. Is a vegan vitamin D supplement as effective to raise your vitamin D levels as a non-vegan one? That one comes to us from Glenna. Yes. Um, it should be absolutely equal. Obviously, the, the best source of vitamin D is to get outside in the sunshine um, and to get fresh air at the same time, maybe do a little bit of walking so you're able to get your physical activity in as well. But the sources should be um, equivalent. In, in addition, uh, there are a lot of vegan foods, plant-based foods that are fortified with vitamin D, um, and there shouldn't be a difference. 
Right, here's a uh, one that came in. It's a follow up on what uh, Dr. Kaliova and I were just discussing. Um, John Swallow at 1221 wants to know how unusual is it to be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 29? Um, it's not, uh, so type 1 diabetes, certainly at a younger age, it's discovered much sooner because, you know, you, you, once you run out of insulin, you're very sick. And that, and, and that usually happens at a younger age. But it's not unheard of uh, to be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in, at a later age. I actually have patients who were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in their 40s. Uh, so it is possible. There's also, we didn't get into it with um, uh, Dr. Kaliova, but there is such a phenomenon or there's a type one and a half diabetes as well, um, or uh, flatbush diabetes. We won't get into that, but it's not uncommon. It is possible. Uh, here's a question, interesting one from 1206 on a different subject. Erica Curtis wants to know, are spider and or varicose veins an early sign of other health issues? And is there a way to prevent getting them? Um, so there is a genetic component to getting spider veins and varicose uh, veins. And from what I understand, it's more of a cosmetic issue versus a sign of anything um, more serious or more ominous happening. And there's certainly treatments available, cosmetic treatments available to um, rid yourself of that. Um, but the things that can be helpful to prevent it are to raise your legs when you um, are done with a long day of standing, because we know that pressure uh, can sometimes worsen um, the, the appearance of these varicose veins. So, and as soon as you notice them, as soon as you start to see them, to you know, seek care with your doctor and get referred to a specialist. Uh, Yuko checking in from Japan saying hi from Tokyo. Hi. Nice oh, to wow. see you. Thanks for watching us halfway around the world. That's fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. Grace Hanks has a question at 1207. She says it's silly, but I think that this is a fantastic question that a lot of people are probably wondering. She says, when docs say one cup of leafy greens, is that loosely packed or tightly packed in there? What are you guys talking about when you say one cup? <laughs> So it could be both. It can be, um, it really, and it does depend, right? So there is a difference between a cup of spinach that's like just fresh spinach versus cooking that down because that turns into like a tablespoon of spinach. Let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I talk about a cup of um, leafy vegetables, I do try to make the distinction between fresh or cooked. Uh, cooked, certainly there's more of it because you're losing the water. So you're getting a concentrated amount of, of the nutrients in your greens, um, but you may lose some of the nutrients just because it's cooked down. There's benefit to both. Uh, so it, it really does depend on what you're using it for. A cup of greens might be related to, you know, the amount of your salad, if you're preparing a salad versus a pasta that has a cup of uh, cooked down spinach in it. So it could be either or. Uh, when I talk to my patients, it really depends on what they're eating. Here's a great question uh, coming to us from Sherry on Facebook. She says, my daughters have low iron and they don't eat meat. They also have low vitamin D. Do you have any suggestions? Yes. So iron rich foods, dried fruits. So figs, uh, prunes are an amazing source of iron in addition. So one of the untoward side effects of having iron or having to take iron supplements can be constipation. But the beauty of eating dried fruits to get iron from um, is that there's a lot of fiber in dried fruits. And so it helps to kind of offset some of those uh, potential side effects. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, th this is a pro tip and this is going to sound really random, but like if you, if you do uh, your own roasted chickpeas and then you have that with some dried figs for whatever reason that it absolutely tastes amazing. It is, it sounds so weird, <laughs> but I'm telling you that once it hits your lips, it's so good. Um, I love it. I, I mean, give it a try. Let me know. Uh, here's and a question. All that, protein, all that protein. I love it. I'm saying, right? Uh, question from Pam on Facebook. Vegetarian cheese has coconut oil and is saturated fat. So what cheese then can be consumed occasionally? I guess Pam's looking for a cheat day. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So I don't have any specific brands that I could recommend right off, uh, right off the bat, but you're right. Just looking at um, the making sure there isn't coconut oil because a lot of the uh, cheese alternatives, the plant-based alternatives do have coconut oil, has saturated fat. What I would look for are cheese products that are made out of almond milk that don't have added oils um, in it. It might be a little bit difficult to do. There's also nut-based cheeses as well, if you wanted to use that, um, that are um, yeah, like cashew-based and macadamia nut-based cheese products as well. But just double check that there isn't an additional um, bit of coconut oil in it. 
I don't think I've done the macadamia nut cheese. That's mm -hmm. interesting. I know all about the cashews, but <laughs> right. macadamia, yeah. that's a new one. Uh, question from Lee at 1224. Should we be eating according to blood type, type A, type B, et cetera? Oh, that's an interesting question. I think I've actually been asked this by a patient um, before. That is an interesting concept, um, but I'm not familiar with that, the ideology behind it. My experience has been in my medical clinical knowledge um, is that it doesn't matter if you're type A, B, O, A, B, plants are going to be helpful for you. Plants are going to be the answer. Um, fiber, plants, nutrients, whole foods, uh, no matter your blood type. So that's, again, the beauty of a whole food plant-based diet is that it doesn't actually Certainly, it does matter whether you have these chronic diseases, but I don't um, say this is a diabetic diet or this is a diet, you know, a diet to treat your uh, high blood pressure or your obesity. This is a whole food plant based diet that across the board, no matter your blood type, no matter your chronic disease, no matter the type of diabetes that you have, as Dr. Kaliova mentioned today, is going to have some benefit. What do you know about stevia? Sally Palmer is asking at 1227. What do you know about the research on stevia being helpful? So stevia is um, a plant um, sugar. It's still considered a processed sugar unless you're, I guess, taking the stevia leaf and crushing it and using it in your food. So it's still considered a processed food. Um, in addition, it's, an, it's still an artificial sweetener. So your body still kind of your taste buds, starting from your taste buds to the rest of your body, still kind of react to that. Um, I, I still have to, you know, go back and look at and update myself on what the um, most recent research is on stevia, but because it is a processed food and because it's an artificial sweetener, I'd say if you're using it, use it very sparingly. Um, but if you if you can avoid it, uh, that's probably better. What, what do you know about the connection between those types of natural sweeteners and the way that the brain reacts to them versus regular sugar? We hear so much about sugar being so addictive. Does does stevia and things like that light up the brain the same way? I believe so. Um, so your body still tastes uh, the sweetness of it. And in fact, some of these sweeteners are exponentially much more sweeter than sugar because one, you want to cut down on the amount of uh, refined sugar that you're using, but the artificial sugars actually give your brain and your body this feedback of, oh my gosh, I love this. I'm getting so much sugar. So your brain does react similarly. So cutting back on sugar or sweet end food, no matter what it is that you're using, um, it's, is, is going to be better for you. In the home stretch here, time for one more question, but I got to get to this comment from Larry Patterson at 1229. Uh, huge fan of the show. Thanks, Larry. Uh, whole food plant-based for 800, Alex. Uh, Larry, I'm just going to go ahead and say that you got the daily double. Good job, my man. Um, <laughs> all right. Final question comes to us from Lucas at 1229. Are there any good cleanses for your gallbladder sludge? How do we clean that up? So great question. I don't believe in cleanses. There's no such thing as a cleanse. The best cleanse I'm going to sound like a broken record in every time I come on here, but eating a whole food plant-based diet that is rich in fiber, that's rich in antioxidants, getting your daily, um, at least half your body weight's worth of ounces and water a day, that is the best cleanse for you. Getting rid of your um, it's their sludge that's in your gallbladder um, and your body kind of takes care of it. But if you feed your body the right things, um, including a whole food plant-based diet, your body has a chance to actually heal itself uh, and to take care of itself. There's nothing that we need to do to force our bodies to cleanse itself, apart from just giving it a break from assaulting it with fatty foods, with convenience foods, with fast foods. Just get rid of that, allow your body to actually do the work of healing itself, and then feed it the good things that it can use to heal itself. Dag on, assaulting itself with those foods. That's that's some strong verbiage. I like that. I might use that on this very show. Well played. I uh, can't let you go without asking about how things are going at the Barnard Medical Center. We talked about it just a, a little bit, but um, I want to ask specifically if there are patients checking in who are concerned about some of the comorbidities that we've been talking about in relation to COVID-19, the diabetes, hypertension, things of that nature. A lot of people checking in, hoping to get some help in that arena. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, this is the time to be, it's always a good time and it's never too late. I think, I think that's really key and important. As we learn more data, as more evidence emerges, uh, we'll, we, you know, we'll make our, we'll know more, but as it stands, people who are coming in to see us are definitely interested in making a change to their diet, in making sure that they're decreasing their risk of developing any of these comorbidities that could potentially put them at risk. Absolutely. And I think that it's uh, such great news now that the Barnard Medical Center able to see patients in Florida. Yes. We've been talking about that just in the last week, which is tremendous given, you know, the sheer number of cases that are happening down there right now. I mean, really across the country, but just the addition of Florida right now seems particularly timely. Uh, you can also schedule an appointment if you live in California. That's another major yes. hotspot. New York had its battles right here in Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, Missouri, Arizona, hotspot, Colorado, Massachusetts. Massachusetts and Kentucky, all of those locations, you can make an appointment today by visiting barnardmedical.org or picking up the phone and calling 202-527-7500. The doctors, such as Dr. Sardana here, Dr. Jazz, as well as the dietitians, they will be able to help get you on a healthier path. So uh, Dr. Sardana, thank you so very much for your time today. Greatly appreciate it as always. Thank you so much for having me, Chuck. It's always a good time. All right. Now, if you want to learn even more stuff, I would suggest heading over to Apple Podcast or wherever shows are available, looking for the Exam Room Podcast. That's the original incarnation of this show. Been doing that one for about three years. Now, out today is a brand new episode with a guest that was not on this show. This is exclusive now. I had an opportunity to sit down and interview Dr. Martin Heller. Now, what this gentleman does in addition to being just extraordinary, is he studies the connection between what you eat and the impact on the environment. And he has come up with high greenhouse gas emission diets and low greenhouse gas emission diets. And we were able to do a head-to-head -head comparison of how a meat-heavy diet compares to a plant-based diet. And the differences are absolutely astounding. And to take it a step further, it's not just about the environment. He was also able to show a correlation between people who eat a high greenhouse gas emission diet have a much higher risk of having cardiovascular disease or strokes and diabetes and was able to quantify that really extraordinary research. And I could not let him go either without having the opportunity to ask, of course, about Burger King's new reduced methane's emission whopper, uh, which itself turned out to be just a clever marketing ploy. The way he was able to really break down this science, of course, there's a little bit of good to it, but the benefits are being far, far overstated. And really, uh, he's able to prove that the only true way, the best way to cut down on greenhouse gas emissions and improve the environment uh, as far as what you're eating is to adopt a plant-based diet. Now, Dr. Heller, that interview is out today on the Exam Room Podcast. So head over to Apple Podcast or Spotify. Look for the Exam Room Podcast by the Physicians Committee. Hit that subscribe button and leave a five-star rating if you would be so kind. By the way, he is also speaking at the upcoming International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine. That will be August 6th through 8th, online completely for the very first time this year. And we have a very special offer just for you right now, our exam room viewers. If you go to register at pcrm.org slash ICNM and you use the promo code exam20, lowercase, exam20 and then the number 20, you will receive 20% off your registration. So pcrm.org slash ICNM using the promo code exam20, and you will have access to three days of knowledge, the likes of which you could never possibly fathom. Everybody will be there. It's going to be a virtual who's who of everyone in the preventative medicine community, including Dr. Barnard, Dr. Heller, Dr. Michael Greger will be presenting as well. It's going to be a phenomenal event, pcrm.org slash ICNM. Use that promo code EXAM20. For us here today, it's going to wrap things up. My thanks to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen. Our director is Donna Steele, and our producer extraordinaire is Laura Anderson. For Drs. Hada Kaliova and Jasmo Sardana and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for watching us today. We'll see you again right back here at noon Eastern tomorrow. Until then, please remember, take a stand, stay safe, and keep it plant-based.